How can that's the best? How is much better? Yes. Yeah. And just another group. Uh, now, I think there was a question about the criteria for the design as well. I can explain it for this particular project. For this project, we use uh, something that I can call it two level design criteria. Therefore, I already showed you the hazard for 475 and 1000 year equation. And the philosophy in a way was that do the analysis from two levels of earthquake and have different criteria for the two levels of earthquake. And in practical term, what we mean was that, okay, 475 year return period, earthquake happens more often. Let's keep everything completely operational after that earthquake. Otherwise we lose money. Therefore, no permanent damage. Without interruption, the work will continue. And uh, yeah, and mechanical components continue. Therefore, generally everything should be elastic. Everything should be formed and go back very fast. And so that there's no permanent deformation and damage and everything keeps on fine. Here's level two for that particular project. And uh, 1,000 1, year return period, the stronger earthquake happens less often, it's less probable. And therefore, we don't want to collapse, collapse is dangerous or more expensive to uh, like retrofit, so we don't want to collapse it. Maybe they stop functioning, but they shouldn't fall off. And uh, maybe the large system close up for repair for some measure months after that. And uh, there's a limitation to some permanent displacement. So everything will not remain elastic after the earthquake. Some people measure everything as more a little bit, which is manageable and could be repaired, although it might take a few months of time. So I, the details are not important, but the concept is important to know that you know something to do with uh, design. And there are limitations for the deformation that was acceptable. Uh, this part, I yeah, could go this one faster. That was, so the previous one was focused on the lock system. And I did have a few slides on the green walls. Which uh, the opening, the, the entry of the ships, and they have more three dimensional uh, uh, nature. Therefore, the 2D section was not adequate. Do you have to do 3D modeling for that? But the 3D nature of the system. However, so these are just behind two maybe know, about 50 years ago. So in today's practice, this is very coarse mesh and not very accepted. Also, we should really refine our mesh is make it much nicer mesh than, than what I have shown here. At that time, we came up with a tree and we said that okay, I am interested in a few of these uh, monoliths. So I put a fire mesh on those monoliths and make the rest of the system coarser. <clears throat> and besides, besides we use a sub-model idea so that we pull out the reaction of these monoliths and even run them one more time with even fire mesh. Applying the displacements that are behind the from the bigger model. But at that time, uh, we didn't have to have complete things, or I don't know how to use it. So we wanted to use pieces of 15 years ago. Um, this is, yeah, I'm mean, you know, a structural engineer. So when you want to design, say, a wall like this, you are interested in section sources, especially for reinforced concrete, the localized crack is less important because you're putting enforcement in there and you're interested in section forces and the program can provide section forces 
share idea moments so that the more design engineer can use it and check the capacity, demand versus capacity for the section. Load combinations, I think there was a question in the ask as well. Yeah, most of our DDMs, uh, we talked about load combinations, but load combinations are important to us, again, for level one versus level two. Uh, level one, because it's more frequent, it has a higher uh, load factor. Maybe a little bit different from what you see in the end code. This is more like older US practice where you do apply 1.4 to the load, but uh, I don't know, this 1.25 maybe, I have it in your other courses. Hydraulic factor and uh, reduction factor for because of this, I think, unusual load. And this one is more inf infrequent, so when you have more infrequent load, you use a lower load factor. And uh, <clears> the <throat> explanation of the hydraulic factor is sometimes important it increases the load and uh, therefore the structure will become more watertight and then that's the indication of uh, using a higher load spectrum and yeah this is another maybe sometimes important i don't know if i can describe it fast enough um, so when you do the, your seismic analysis, you get your section forces, you get your moments and shear forces, which are important to you. And you see that at the moment during earthquake, your demand over capacity is greater than one. Is it, uh, <clears throat> is it uh, always a red flag? Uh, what we, I mean, sometimes we see that if you want to use that as a red flag, you can come up with the opposite exceptions. While the idea is that, especially for the more infrequent earthquakes, that moment when the demand over capacity is motivated than one might be a millisecond. So, is it important if it uh, passes that, like if it's more than one? For a second, yes or no. And I mean, more should be done at least. I can say that. Yeah, go ahead. This is experience. Yeah, because the wording from the criteria means more than, I think. If it goes, oh, okay. <clears throat> so let me explain it better. Says for level one, level one was the lower equation. Because I said one time is not really an indicator, it's not a red flag for this project. They said it can go up to three times more than one. And the state is not, you don't consider it broken. So you have an earthquake that happens very fast and like a thousand times back and forth. You see up to three times you went the demand over capacity greater than one, you say it's a pass, it's okay. But if it's more than three times, then it's a failure. So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, here is more critical than for Yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a, exactly goes back to the ductility issue. Shear damage is considered less ductile. So, uh, normally in all goes and all practices, different practices, bridges. Um, so you, are, you are more careful with your fear rather than your betting. But you know, we have this discussion all the time in our work that, oh, I did a, a time history and I see that one time the demand is very high, and then we should discuss it and make sure that one time is not that enough to damage this much. And then for level two, because it happens less frequency, uh, less frequently, we are even less stringent and we allow three times greater than 1.5 or we allow that. 
But I can't remember that just wanted to introduce you to the concept that this project was a specific. And then you have uh, how do you check uh, demand versus capacity? Um, because that's right, that you may work. And especially for the walls, you have the axial moment capacity curves that you can do using the software or using the code. And you may have quick, maybe a few times your uh, interaction goes out of the scale, which are the exceptions that was mentioned in the other slide. That's like inside the scale is acceptable, outside is not. And this is discussing a uh, concrete design course. So it will be possible as a call, like a column, yes? People. Yeah, those walls, yeah, that I think is mostly okay. important for the walls. Other building and earthquake is I will get beams that can go in compression. Okay, so the bar is on the time should I jump into the uh, yeah, I think yeah, because it's a different topic, and maybe we should end up getting into this and jump into the uh, yeah, the other one. Well, I can always come back to this one. This was an interesting study. But I want to miss gaps because I needed to look at some gaps. And if we have more time at the end, then we can go back to that study. <clears throat> yeah, so this is a good photo opportunity. You shared it with my company they know that I presented there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they said that they want it for their social media. So this is the presentation I gave to the CDA conference. CDA, I just talked about the CDA publication. It's uh, like an uh, organization that tries to streamline, keep it down, design and retrofit in Canada. It's not as mandatory as your national building code, but it's that you all try to understand the, their publications and they have annual conferences, which are uh, held in different Canadian cities. And it's internationally recognized that people are coming from outside Canada as well. <clears throat> like in 2019, I presented a good work that we did in concrete and there about uh, seismic performance of an old concrete outcome that I will show you. <clears throat> so I do, uh, I will obviously introduce you to the dam. And as I said, we always yeah, can take the property that we use our assumptions and the combinations. For that dam, we did thermal analysis as well, besides the experience analysis, and consider construction sequencing, and also, as usual, seismic performance, which is important in British Columbia. Yeah, this is a uh, really snake dam with a very nice uh, double curvature dam, which is in close to Power River in Sunshine Coast. Very nice area, and they have this very nice team dam in there. Uh, so old dam, 1947, and the height about 60 meter, which is a good average dam. Because it's art dam, it's keen because it holds it's like it has this curvature and holds on to the buttons. Versus we have art dam versus majority of them are gravity dams that just stack a big chunk of concrete sitting on the ground. But this one is uh, transferring the loads to the sideways and also to the bottom. So it reduces the amount of concrete that you need. <clears throat> Some dimensions there. And left. 
So this side is like into a uh, rocket slope, so it's connected to the rocket slope. Uh, and on this side, we have a truss flight. Basically, I mean, for most of the arc down, we would prefer to be in a narrow valley so that both sides are connected to the rock, second rock. However, the Texas Valley was not narrow enough, so they had to put basically big chunks of concrete again here so that it's one of the arrangements is a big chunk of concrete. And here is the screen of the dam, still raining where they want to do you know, they get rid of some water and there's a flood, etc. They open this area gates here, and they open them and the water goes away. <laughs> yeah, the dam uh, the had 16 blocks. And these blocks are key to each other. I will explain, I will show a picture of how they are key to each other. Means that they have shear keys between the two consequent blocks, vertical blocks. Uh, the important structure that sits right on top of the dam is this structure. That's the hoist. Of the, like the hoist system of the gate that I mentioned. So the gate is at the bottom here. They open this gate so that the water goes and start. And start is basically a very long tube, a tube that carries water, maybe to, in this case, probably what the uh, powerhouse. So the, to generate electricity, they carry water from the bottom of the down to the powerhouse, which is miles away and generates electricity. But in terms of the structural, because if this structure was important, this structure is where the horse is, where they put up and down the um, valve of this uh, penstite, gate of this penstite. Um, this is located on top of the dam, so there are and equipment comes to uh, vibrations in a way here. And the SPV I showed you on the previous slide is on the side of the uh, on the dam, which has six, oh, I don't know how many, six, yeah, six radial gates. One is a small, five are larger. And, yeah, and then, so this is an old project that we have right now that the owner. It is, and this is owned by private sector. The owner is interested in operating this area and this effect, it is rusted, etc. So they're being better extended in this area. But at that time, that was uh, like a study, general stability and a strength of the gap. <clears throat> Most of the time, uh, we should start our work with really trying to imagine the what we call potential failure modes, like what we are looking for, what may go wrong, and list them, and then try to address that by other analysis. Uh, one is more obvious, uh, extensive cracks and the spotting of the dam, concrete leads to breach of the dam, and uncontrolled release of the reservoir. So a um, basic uh, major earthquake happens and not selfishal cracks, selfishal cracks, I mean, they are not that important. I mean, they're important, but it's not critical. But then the cracks that are so big that you would say, okay, this will collapse and water will move downstream and will damage properties and harm people. <laughs> And the voice structure, the voice structure was the one that I showed, which was maybe, poor, maybe some sort of poor design, I can say that, but it was placed on the top of the ground on the worst location, quick wise. A spillway, I showed you what it is. Uh, the whole spillway is sitting on the right, it might slide, slide down or even overturn. And the part of the dam is holding on to the rock, and uh, <clears throat> that's again something 
your technical specialist should explain this one and then they do something called fraud footage analysis, which means that they should imagine where some values of fraud can be as displaced and move down the stream in a hand. Basically, jeopardize the whole strategy. And then, you know, we always acknowledge the properties and uh, assumptions and static modules. So, for this project, this was on that private sector, the damage on the private sector, always makes lower budget. So, we used uh, properties like the loops. Uh, and, uh, but then, the worst you can uh, use that kind of tree is normally lower for the damage model. Uh, in this case, the book, like the book, we said dynamic modulus should be 50% more than a static modulus. Poisson's ratio in this way of concrete typical. What is the compressive strength? And then on the lower side, even a strength uh, goes up when you are in dynamic mode, like when the load is dynamic. Um, but Compensated inside, and when you don't have test results, there are like <laughs> groups and, and equations for that. Rock material properties, not really. It's something else I wanted to do. Here, uh, that, what I it called uh, our shear keys between the consequent monoliths is a good picture of construction of the dam. So this is what we call uh, shear keys between the monoliths. So that although the two monoliths side by side, they can separate a little bit, but they cannot shear off with respect to each other, they hold onto each other. So the vertical shear keys, we have good picture of the construction of the gap. So it's uh, very important for our work. Again, in more photos of the construction. Uh, these are geotechnical properties, some uh, uh, testing, like the coring of the body around the dam, and some by uh, engineering judgment. Why this picture might help the geotechs? Because they see that this is a rough surface where the concrete was placed. Therefore, they concluded that the uh, friction angle could be on the higher side. So, yeah, everybody, really, especially the geotechs, are really careful in the historic features and how construction was performed to make this again about the properties that they suggest. Again, values we see from them and the reports, which they are directed in the reports, so that. Uh, every day I can correlate our results with other assumptions. This friction angle, again, by geotechs, um, <clears throat> like they, I mean, this solution says that when you have a lighter structure, you have a higher friction angle. That's what I learned from them. The um, uh, monoliths are taller and heavier, but they have a smaller friction angle, and the steel is shorter and lighter is higher friction angle. The vertical construction contraction joints. Uh, I think this was based on the uh, uh, C standard association concrete design book that says for monolithically placed shear is can use up to 50 side edges. Going to side of your course. Uh, again, we try to model the chunk of the foundation around it because we really want to do the interaction. Like uh, this analysis, the one important subject is that it accounts for the down foundation interaction and also water and down uh, interaction during the earthquake. We use this software for the machine. We had it because of one of the clients, but it's very expensive. So now I'm looking for recommendation for the more incidental software. And 
we have a solution as that dictates to us uh, what is the maximum foundation element size that we like your primary modes of the system again tells us what are the wavelengths that will happen in the foundation and we want to divide every wavelength uh, number of elements and um, for a structural part we need to have these three elements per thickness because it gives us better than the estimation as i said like more coming from the older times and newer times the previously older times you were really wanted to use minimum number of elements so you were looking at these sizes of elements because your, your systems were not got limitations but now that are less limitations I just say, okay, this can be a very nice looking foundation. We will go to the light on some cloud computing service. So, these are all solid, right? Right, solid elements, yeah. So, for the, yeah, so have you tried like comparing the solid computer to the shell and the intensity difference? Oh, for this part, you know, because it's thin. Yeah, that's that makes a good research. Yeah, as I think I mentioned in, one, in the previous slideshow as well, that so using hex elements, if we have an engineer who is good at using hex elements, you can fix it many times. But then, then, if you want to use a better solution, then you should study and learn. And, then uh, sometimes goes into learning and sometimes into efficiency and they cancel each other out. So we try to use the correct solution, which are also I mean, repeatable for different projects anyway. But that, that could become maybe maybe able to prove that shell elements create better results in less amount of time. Um, so, um, but, um... Validation model. Because there are lots of assumptions. Very, very good question. Yeah, yeah that's a big, big story of our work. And I wanted to actually present this in the context of the last few slideshows that uh, we missed from the previous one. In that one, in the context of one of our challenges, I wanted to explain that. And for our work, one typical one that we do a lot is uh, what we call progression analysis. And uh, so basically what progression analysis is, uh, is that we go simple to difficult. And we, based on how much time we have, we should really cover a bunch of solutions which are simple, close form to the most difficult. Which means, uh, so in this case, it's less imaginable to go through that process. But let me say, say only I want to do finite elements. Let's start with a model of a single monolith, which is uh, modeled in 2D, and do an analysis on that and read the stresses there because it's easier and easier to understand and easier to check <clears throat> and validate. <clears throat> so I do that. And then I do a 3D model. And then 3D model gives me slightly different results. And then I try to compare the 2D results with 3D results and say, I understand why is it different. Like in this case, it's obvious that if I do 2D, I will get huge stresses at the base because it's cantilevers. And then I make it 3D, then the forces go to the abutments right and left, the earthly forces. And the stress decreases. So we try to imagine or designate a bunch of analysis which are come, it starts from simple hand calculation, going to 2D, going to 3D, and then compare the results coming out from this and then try to justify why the result changed. And in that way, when you get to the most, and then also linear to nonlinear, like I found this one time linear, one time linear. Linear is easier to verify. But, mm -hmm. 
And then I compared the nonlinear with the linear, and I see the stresses at some corner reduced by 10%. And I say I understand this because of this phenomenon. And this progression analysis, progressing from simple solution to the most complex, uh, it's, it's one of the best, or best methods that we use for verification that you mentioned. Yeah. So, so for that one is very verification Often the everything gets when you talk about validation, often you are dealing with experiment. Do you do an experiment on the exam by maybe excited with a small thing and see if you can model it validated or not? Is it a common practice? Yeah, yeah, we are very much like it. I think it's what has one. So we had the ambient vibration test, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So that's that's a good idea. Verification versus validation. Verification, what I was talking about was verification. Validation is normally compared to the test results. Yeah, yeah. And then now, this, especially with BC Hydro, now that they are doing the retrofit, they are also placing a lot of instrumentation in the dams that which are retrofitted. So in a few years' time, they had huge amount of data for their validation. But previously they were poorly instrumented. I mean, the, I mean, there's this you know, way tradition for airfield dams. They put a lot of instrumentation, but for concrete dams, it's not like that because they are less worried in a way about the concrete dams. But now the are is placing a lot of instrumentation, accelerometers. So in a few years' time, any analysis that you do, you can just compare the real life and see how they compare. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the validation and sense verification. Yeah, again, it's our typical type of assumptions. We don't go into uh, nonlinear concrete because that's been making the research project. Normally, we cannot afford that. For concrete, we normally use uh, linear material. However, uh, we try to guess where a major crack may happen, or it's most more probable to happen, and we put additional frictional surfaces there. So not for this project, but then for some other projects, maybe after a few analysis, you understand that here there is a huge stress concentration. Then I will divide it into two parts and put a frictional surface in between to see. If that the stress concentration can be any more fit like or, or bridge it. And damping assumptions are there as well. Again, uh, emphasizing that the foundation is with mass versus what I call the classic method, which was mass solution. Um, now, because we say I draw a case that I have to keep on using it, although this one was you know, this project was not a DCI project. And the uh, radiation damping should be accounted for. Radiation damping meaning those waves going into infinity, but because we don't have an infinite foundation, then there are dampers to mimic that, calculated dampers. And the uh, uh, seismic excitation is applied as traction. If you apply it as acceleration, it's as if you have ST. <clears throat> a stiff boundary and the waves will be trapped and go back and forth. And those are like, some technical details. And okay, then we discuss, we were talking about this the <clears throat> acoustic model, uh, model of the water. I have an example of a project where we really modeled a huge body of water with acoustic elements, but a more classic uh, established way in the industry is to use best regard added mass, which, I mean, that's like the solution that you guys can find it, how to calculate equivalent masses that will mimic the hydrodynamic effects theory and creature. And you apply, you just add those masses to the wet surface of your structure. And we are using this software, LS Dyna. It's a um, very robust software. I actually said that I like it a bit. 
is, as I should say, is even it's robust. It's a robust software, converges well, works well. I normally we use explicit software, and then we start developing explicit versus implicit. But the top reason is that I don't know about the history of it, but then it was somehow picked up by high by dam industry in the US and also by DC Hydro. They probably had good reasons, but then it was a little bit counterintuitive because it's like mostly intended for who say car crashes, etc. But somehow it was picked up by dam seismic engineers. Again, we should always uh, acknowledge the load conditions that we use as the structural engineers. Normal water elevation, flood water elevation, and I didn't emphasize that for but for a team dam, the thermal loading is also important. So that team is thermal loading in summer and in winter. Uh, but for gravity dams, it's less important. Earthquake analysis is important, and for other world post earthquake analysis, it's also important what happens after earthquake in terms of stability. <coughs> if I can get again, explain it a little bit more. So for For a king dam, like an arc dam, we do also thermal analysis, like the difference of temperature between the two sides of the dam causes some additional bending. One side is wet and water, like in winter, water is warmer than water, and in summer it's the other way. And we want to account for that, and it causes some additional stresses. Climatic data we can get from the uh, <clears throat> I forgot the name of them, but it's a government service that you can find on the internet at any close to almost like in, it's been pointed in any many locations in Canada, so you can find the weather information in terms of maximum temperature, daily temperatures, minimum daily temperatures, and average temperatures. And there was a station close to the dam. For a reservoir temperature, for this reservoir, it was not monitored. So we found another dam that for which it was monitored. And we thought that the temperature around in that area is similar to the temperature in the area of upper dam. So we use the water temperature in different months of the year for that gap in Oregon. This is the temperature distributions after we did the thermal analysis for different seasons on the two sides of the dam. Yeah. So you do a thermal analysis, and then you find it on code, and then you find the uh, and for the worst days, not every day, it's like the coldest day of winter or warmest day of summer. You see how the temperature varies to the thickness. One side is water, one side is air, and the temperature is different. And as I said, it causes additional stress. We try to account for what we call construction sequence. Again, looking at the uh, historic picture that we can obtain. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you have done the construction sequencing for any structure. For this particular structure, so I, I manually just create this model in my finite element tool. Uh, so this dam is really, is carried its arc in this horizontal direction. But for this structure, if I apply weight to this structure, there will be an arc action in vertical direction, like the weight tries to go sideways as well, like the arc. 
in the structure. However, uh, if you look at the real construction sequences, that was not possible because each monolith was built independently. So the whole data monolith should go vertically down. It shouldn't go sideways to the two above things. And we try to simply account for that. We don't know the exact uh, consequences, uh, sequences uh, <clears throat> that the dam was built or you know, but we kind of can guess that some of the was on the sides and then some ones in the middle and then they were connected to each other. So we can do like uh, weights, only about weight analysis. So we can do weight analysis for this structure and then add these two monoliths, or we can do weight analysis for this structure, all of them, as if all of them are built in one second. And the result is different. <clears throat> this is probably vertical stresses. And so if there's if there is no construction sequence, meaning everything appears simultaneously, you will have all action. A lot of it is distributed sideways to the side abutments. In real life, there was construction sequence, so each monolith was built separately. So each monolith has time to just vertically transfer its load to the to the bottom. So this is more realistic. Uh, like this monolith because they are taller, they see higher compression and stress because the weight really goes vertically down rather than going to the two sides. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes, uh, I mean, you should do it because sometimes if you don't, you will underestimate the vertical stress here because the pro, I mean, uh, if everything appears simultaneously, the load goes down. Is another interesting concept. Then the outcome of the work. Again, uh, your analysis. This is a still a static analysis, so we are not doing anything dynamic here. Uh, yeah, normal hydrostatic means that water is at the normal level. Summer means the hottest day of summer. And the outcome was. Tension. So this is the maximum tension that I've seen. We previously said that the tensile strength is 2.4. So this is fine. Uh, Corvus stay in winter, and the stress distribution. The stresses are higher. Tensions are higher, than, but they're still meeting the criteria. And, uh, Flood is important, like we have the students of the water, the flood elevation in summer. And again, the stresses are higher, much lower than their capacity. Well, you don't have flood in winter. Yeah, maybe that was on the judgment. Yeah, maybe that's why we avoided that. Okay, that's not good. Really, when we did it and we said the number is high, but then we said no, we should drop it because. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, sometimes we do we do we make those judgment after the fact that like, the winter with this flood causes a lot of stress, but is it real? Is it does it really happen? <laughs> Again, so, so this the previous one was tension. This is similarly for compression, which is normally is not. Like the uh, demand that we are saying is much less than capacity. Deflections are <clears throat> like the worst case is 20 millimeters, and we said the height is 50 meters, so I guess it's less than one in thousand. So it's not really something to be worried about. Okay, so we did the seismic analysis as well. We can do a repeat of the, what we already presented. <clears throat> but then maybe there's another important issue that comes from the CDA guidelines. 
in CDI right now, uh, it prescribes to you what level of earthquake to use for your analysis. So, so we don't normally do two level as I mentioned previously, but the single level that we do is for certain, uh, like this is one in 2,475 years, and this is 10,000 years, and uh, that for that cycle, we have 1,000 years. And this is based on, in a way, in a based on the importance of the structure. So another company or us will do a study on the uh, importance of that structure, meaning how much economic damage it may cause if it is broken, and how many lives are in danger, and how many uh, houses will go underwater, etc. Industry goes underwater. And based on that, they give us some importance of that. Yeah, they call it consequence. And this dam, from what I see, it was like very high consequence. A lot of dams in BC we call them extreme consequence, and they reduce one in 10,000 a year. Those are a lot of most of BC hydro dams. I mean, even the dam itself is too expensive to be broken. So that's Check it for a huge upgrade and make sure that nothing happens or just that public money it shouldn't really be damaged. But then you know, sometimes our dams are close to city and they may cause damage to property, people, everything. So they make that decision and then the government or the licensing department, they should agree with what designation they use. With this project, we had the designation as the document that we received, or most of it my work I Receive it from you know, other done by other companies. So I already know what is the consequence, and then I just connect it with my airplane. These two lines for normal, uh, for horizontal and vertical component of the earthquake by hazard study by the, the technical department. Again, spectral accelerations, very similar presentation. <clears throat> Yeah, that flattening is more important for buildings because buildings like sitting on four columns they easily damage them, soften up. With dams, we don't really foresee that. However, this time I think that's about here, so it was already on the peak. So I mean, the minute they can think about it. Similarly, so teaching some earthquakes from around the world. I mean, the people who are doing the hazard study, they have some software that has tens of thousands of earthquakes and then they just narrow down their search by just picking on the similarity between the site or specifying the specifications of the site and they narrow down and then they pick here seven earthquake. This is yeah this project was 2018 the code there at that time says five to seven earthquakes now I told you we are doing more work on the spillway. Uh, now, right now, National Building Code of Canada says use 11 earthquakes. So we ask the, the subcontractor to provide us 11 earthquakes. Because I mean, both that is like more stringent and also they understand that right now, computer computations, computations are becoming cheaper. So it's something that they do more, give us better results. And yeah, yeah that's it as related to the validation that you mentioned. We have one data point. We perform eigenvalue analysis, which gives us the primary modes of the structure. This is if the reservoir is empty and if the reservoir is full to the normal level. And the test data, at least the one that I was aware of, was an ambient vibration test, which was done by some folks from UBC at the location of this dam. And one of the outcomes of the study was that the dominant period of the structure should be between 0.17 and 0.22. Other analysis was indicating. Point two seven, and then I then said, okay, then we don't need to do modifications or calibration. We are in a good range. We can calculate. So 
Yeah, no, I mean, this is not obviously available all the time, but then it's available to get very happy, obviously, with the people that you have on the right path. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you hear also that the next shift model is the adding by the relationship path, they compare the next shift. They try to estimate it, but maybe they, when they want to do that, they do analysis or they are also analyzing it. So <laughs> they also have some assumptions for their analysis in a way. So that's very what they do is in a very simple primitive. They just install some tools on top of the DAM, some sensors. And then there's no shaking, so they're just ambient vibrations. And based on that, they conclude about the dominant period of the DAM and all shapes, etc. And your uh, simulation the dominant yeah, yeah, yeah. I've tried to show a picture here, so something like that. Going back and forth with maximum detection here. I think I talked about the convolution. Your earthquake is even on top surface. You want to see what it was at the base. And here we concluded that we should. Increase it by five percent or two percent. It doesn't change the results, but we do it for completeness. So that uh, uh, so we basically amplify the earthquake by five percent or two percent at this space, so that the surface earthquake is what we want it to be. For rocks, it's not like super important. And that for soil geotechnical you know, for soil is a very complex issue and very important, but for very strong rock it's just we do it for complete test. And these are the outcome of the analysis. I don't know why they call it by a certain is it if the worst things or yeah so maybe it's only for one of the earthquakes that I first uh yeah we tried to, this, is, this is one of the earthquakes. And for this earthquake, this envelope of tension throughout the earthquake, I think the same thing shown in different ratio. And compared with tension capacity, the tension was always below the tension capacity. But uh, yeah, yeah. 3.6, I think I do right here. And these are the responses that will be recorded the worst point, the worst location. And it was always below. So uh, the envelope the maximum of 5.1. Yeah. Okay. But the tensile strength of 5.1. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, okay. Apparently, I can see that. I Right. Okay. So yeah, then we call it one of the earthquakes, but I tell you the general discussions that we had. So earthquake number one, I don't know, but then one of the earthquakes or the because we normally designed for the median of the earthquakes, and the worst case, the median one is important. Say if earthquake one was the median. We realized that somewhere in the middle, we are seeing more tension than the capacity. Therefore, we had to go for further discussions with other reviewers and board, etc. And we concluded that this doesn't result in failure. There's another slide that I will show the discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the interfaces they could separate, vertical interfaces they could separate, and the bottom could separate. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we just see the tension as the base of the So the surface this moment. 
Uh, not for this now, and then because the criteria in this is very stringent, like it's one in five thousand year earthquake, and that never happened during our lives, so that we not know, but we try to understand that. So what I mean is that what we are designing for maybe never happened so far. So so we are trying to design for something that haven't happened yet. Good. Yeah, so that discussion that I want to make, and I was like this slide I cannot remember what it's poorly presented, is that we were seeing high stresses here and um, we concluded that although those stresses are high, but they don't result in failure. Therefore, for this particular observation, we didn't recommend uh, retrofitting. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, how would you think one of the constructions uh, just to consider the temperature and uh, put the spontaneity in the stress? Oh, you mean that put them loosely and then increase the temperature? Yeah, yeah, I have seen people come up with different innovative ways of doing the construction sequences. But the way we did it, like we, if we didn't want to exactly replicate what the construction, but we want we didn't want the arc action vertical direction happen. Therefore, we we did it in two steps. So step number one, two of the monoliths were missing, and step number two, those two monoliths appeared, and therefore. The whole node that is vertical, almost mostly vertical. Okay. Now, this chance to flow response spectra. Maybe I come back to this in a minute. I want to go back to that, to go to that discussion. Yeah, so seismic. Resolved this question. This one even I didn't present it in the conference, but it has some of the summary yeah. that we yeah. had. Yeah, so it was related to the previous slide, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you also consider the loads and factors in the procedure of construction besides the final design, or not for? Yeah, I know that during construction, during those. Building. Those are yes. very important for some structures, but, but not that. for like for the main down. I never saw that they do that. But then, I mean, you say know, you want to install a beam and then you carry it from the middle and bring it here. Yes, maybe because yeah. uh, in those analyses, there mm -hmm. are a bit different. Yeah, they would be a bit different from the final results, so that we would face higher mm -hmm. tensions. Mm -hmm. So, should an engineer also think about that? Always, yeah. When you are preparing your DDM, you should think about it. Say, okay, that, does it happen or not? Mm -hmm. For a structures or especially industrial structures, it happens a lot that like you have a huge beam, and then so you design it for the time when it's sitting on column. However, when you are carrying the beam to that location, maybe it's even worse load condition. So, do we? Also but here, yeah, could you imagine that like you were pouring concrete to build those monoliths and so no, no. Well, yeah, but I really should think carefully. That's why we do that failure model studies and a lot of engineers sit and discuss and discuss so that because maybe we miss one of these issues. Yeah, so we should always be aware of them. Maybe I missed something. Well, but I wanted to, yeah, yeah, yeah I wanted to. Bring in the discussion on having a uh, large, larger than acceptable local tension. So previously, you saw that in the other project that I showed, we had this issue. We had this conclusion that it should be cumulative damage. One time is not enough. That we always think about that. However, I was quickly doing it this morning. Sorry. So yeah, the first one said, so at least for one of the analysis, maybe that was the one that we were presenting. Definitely the concrete tension we had not that in the report in the face of the tallest monoliths, so past the capacity. So during the epic, some cracks will happen. But is it dangerous to us? Because remember that when initially I was talking about the failure modes, I said, I didn't say only crack, I said such a bad crack that causes damage of the dam so that we lose control of water. 
I mean, here, doing it now linear was more conservative because it accounted for the fact that sometimes the joints open and the cantilever action uh, happens in the tallest monolith that causes a lot of stress. So it's real, it's not something that the computer program generated. Higher stress will happen. However, on one side, it could be a little bit exaggerated because uh, we didn't model shear keys, we just put in the modeling, we put uh, just modeling side by side. The shear keys will prevent such a movement that will result in that huge stress. Then the critical tension, the high tensions, higher than acceptable tensions, was penetrating about a quarter of the thickness. And damaging the quadrat thickness is not enough to overturn that blood or damage that blood. And so I think it is very fast. So basically it's like your analyst or myself, I do an analysis, I say, oh, I see higher stresses, what should I be doing? And then the meetings after meetings and a lot of season and Jimmy can say, no, maybe you are overestimating. Maybe this doesn't even really mean that uh, that product will fall into water. So it's not as if the, the computer program has spit out something and then we put in a report or then they can't put it in so. so we go through all that argument to understand what happened and whether it's really alarming or not. And uh, I know that one argument I made in a couple years was that is there a cone of failure? Like, even if that plug is cracked at mid height, can it really move forward and fall into downstream side? Because, <clears throat> like, this is a curvature. I'm sure you know. Down. And the blocks are like this is the tallest block. And even if it cracks at some elevation, it cannot really move down the stream because the other blocks are preventing it from moving down the stream. So it's not as if it cracks at the end. So you are seeing huge failure. Yeah, there are some redundancies in the system, even if that happened. But then the observation is that the highest sense was one quarter of the thickness of the blood. So uh, I don't know which side, but then say, yeah. So one quarter has higher stress. It's not, it's not as if the whole blood is sheared. That was another reason. And uh, one observation on why this might be correct, because the vertical joint, because we did a good modeling, we could account for that vertical joints opening during earthquake, and therefore this acted as a lever, like it lost its uh, uh, arch down property, one monolith was acting alone, and therefore it solved a huge amount of stress. Um, one reason that this huge stress was overestimated because we didn't account for the shear keys. So, when you say you don't know how to interpret it, you mean there is no, there is no connection between the blocks, the monolith? Yeah, in the model, like in the real life, uh, as I showed, like if this is one of the one of its, they are cheated to each other. I mean, that's showing schematically they are cheated to each other. Consequent monoliths. So even if this joint opens by like one centimeter, it doesn't mean that these two have lost control of each other. 
in the modeling, we replace this by some friction only. So as soon as they detach, this power monolith is acting alone. Uh, those are certain part action. Uh, therefore, that's uh, computable. And this will see huge stress. So you don't model the shear field, but you model the counter by some friction. Yeah, right. or as if we are modeling the broken shear keys. We try to model the broken shear keys. That's kind of the worst case. Yeah. Is it a process to actually model the shear keys and then compare it? Like the comparing? Yeah, like at the beginning, that we want to make the decision. It's it's very probable that in a new shear field, those shear keys break really. So we have justification for that. Besides the simplicity and the fact that we should finish the work more quickly. Okay. Uh, so that should be yeah, yeah. Should be more discussion or again. Yeah. 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 It's up to you. No, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any chance in the red is a possible Yeah, it was a very, very insightful presentation. Thanks for coming over. Okay. Is there any question, uh, burning question? Okay, with that, I would like to thank you. And as a token of appreciation, uh, I would like to. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you. Thank you.